we've got at least one new joiner on the call. I just wondered if, if you haven't been on a call already, do you want to just uh, briefly introduce yourself? Phil, do you want to go first? Sure. Hi, I'm Phil Jackson. Um, I'm working with the ODI at the moment to um, help with the specification writing and uh, dealing with people or helping people implement the specifications. Great, Hi. thanks. Um, anybody else who has not made it to a previous call? Yeah, sorry, me. I missed the start of that as I was working to unmute my uh, <laughs> turn my actual sound on and things. So, what was the question? I just I just said the last bit. If anyone who's not made it for one of these before, I was just asking people who hadn't been before just to quickly introduce themselves so we know who everybody is. I guess that. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Guy Horton. I work at Gladstone as one of the product owners, um, and I'm kind of looking at our kind of next generation of consumer product and. Um, where that overlaps with the kind of open aptic objectives and things like that. So kind of taking over from where Tom V and I know has been involved previously and Pete Walker, um, so kind of carrying on from, from where they've left off really. Okay, great. Okay. Well, um, thank you for joining. Um, I'll, um, get started on, um, today's agenda. Um, so, um, so for, for guys benefit, we have these calls every couple of weeks. Um, we use it as a uh, chance to kind of regularly check in with the, um, the standards group uh, about the technical work we're doing on the project um, and also gives us time to discuss some of the kind of technical questions and issues that have come up um, in the intervening period. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so on the um, agenda for today, um, I wanted to uh, just give a, a brief update on where we are with making progress on the booking API. Um, then we've got, um, we've cir I've circulated a couple of uh, updated drafts of the opportunity data model and the paging specification. Um, um, uh, Liam, you seem to have frozen on your, with the speaker view up for some reason. I don't know if you can uh, hide that or something. All the slide that's there, maybe click on the browser. How about that? Now it's green. So you can't see the slides? No, it's all green now. Let's try that again. Strange. How about now? Yeah. That's better. Okay. Right, um, so I wanted to kind of just briefly check in on the those updated draft documents. Um, I, uh, other than Nick, I don't think anyone's provided feedback on the, the paging spec yet, um, but there has been some discussion around the facilities proposal that I wanted to touch on, because um, I'm keen to, to move that forward. Um, and then if we have time, I just wanted to kind of uh, briefly check in around um, data validation. Um, it's something that we need to start um, spending a bit more time thinking about. Um, so I just wanted to have a, a kind of a brief discussion around that um, and ask for some kind of input um, and suggestions from people. Um, and again, if there's anything that anyone wants to raise on the call, then um, let me know. I'll, there'll be some time at the end. Um, so um, in terms of the, the booking work, um, I'm trying to kind of include a regular check-in on this every couple of weeks because there's quite a lot of activity that, that's happening um, uh, at the moment. So there are, um, we have been working with a, a group of people who have been um, creating uh, early implementations of a uh, booking specification. So um, I'll circulate these slides afterwards so you can follow the links. But there is a version 0 0.3 of a booking spec that um, a few people have been successfully implementing. Um, we've been doing that because there were some specific projects that were looking at uh, booking um, that were running um, uh, in this kind of uh, first quarter of the year. Um, we wanted to make sure that was um, uh, being done in line with the kind of uh, best practices and use cases that we defined for the program. And it was a good way, it's a good way to uh, get some early implementation feedback on the kind of design that we were we had in mind. Um, so that seems to be going um, 
uh, pretty well. Um, uh, Nick can probably give a bit more colour to where we are with some of the implementations in a minute. Um, but our plan now is to, based on what we've learned um, on that early work, is to um, start creating a more fully fledged, more detailed uh, specification. So um, I think it's fair to say that the, the initial document is a kind of working document, so it focuses very much on um, what's been required to get those early implementations up and running. Um, but there's a bit more kind of background information and certainly um, more uh, detail that has to go in in a few places. So that's something that um, Phil is helping us move forward with at the moment. Um, so we're hoping to get a, uh, well the plan is to get an updated specification published um, ideally by the end of the month, but certainly by the beginning of April. Um, there's a few areas that the current early draft doesn't touch on, so it doesn't take into account the um, uh, booking of facilities, um, partly because we're talking about that in parallel, but I want to make sure that what we're designing works for that context as well. Um, and it's mostly focused on booking um, individual events, um, but we haven't really thought through yet how to handle events that um, are published with a schedule. Uh, there'll need to be some extra um, metadata published about some of those opportunities to help integrate them with the booking flow, workflow that we've been um, defining. Um, and we've also been identifying some of the additional, doc additional documentation that needs to go uh, alongside that specification. So like the other specs, um, they're, they're meant to be reference documentation, but we're, you know, we're well aware that um, developers will need some additional support to help them actually build implementations. So the, we will be creating some uh, tutorial under the guidance. Um, and Phil's also going to be working on putting together some um, Swagger API specs that will give a, another way to navigate through um, some of the specification content. Um, so that, that's where we are at the moment. That's moving forward. Um, we're very happy to take uh, feedback on the existing uh, document um, and also the updated spec when it's, um, when it's circulated. Um, Nick, is there anything else that you uh, think I should mention or you want to um, chip in at this point? Uh, it might be good to get um, to know Siv and Sam, are you on the call? I know that there's uh, people in implementing this at the moment. I think you guys might be representing those people. Uh, how's it going? Uh, yeah, we're on the call. Hang on, sorry. Uh, Although you're yeah. quite quiet. Uh, yeah, it's going fine. Um, we haven't found any any problems with the spec, and if we well, we haven't found any major problems with the spec, but the ones we have, we've noted down on the document. Um, stuff like account ID doesn't need to be uh, passed through for example, and just other changes. Um, but other than that, no, it's fine. It's implemented. Um, I think Good Jim have implemented it and so have our parks, I think. So uh, yeah, we're definitely not the only ones, um, which is good. Uh, and at least the Good Jim one looks fine as well. So uh, yeah, all good. Uh, okay, that's great. That's good to know. Um, uh, is there, um, are there particular bits of uh, additional documentation, you know, like tutorials or things you think it would be useful for us to put together? Um, I think a few more examples for those that aren't uh, completely familiar with the modeling spec was the, is probably the only place that I'd, I'd, I'd change it. Um, things where some fields are optional, for example, uh, which one was it? I think rem uh, remaining attendee capacity uh, is optional for those that have uh, an unlimited slot like uh, Good Gym. Uh, whereas something like that's not abundantly clear at, at first, and that's just one example. And of course, if you know the modeling spec inside out, then that it doesn't need to be said, but um yeah other than that i don't think so i think maybe just a few more ex examples of requests and responses where uh, the schema isn't a hundred percent tight um yeah other than that okay. no not that anything else i can think of okay that's helpful thanks i, I think we're, we're planning to put some um 
sequence diagrams to show the kind of request response cycle in the updated spec as well to help people kind of get their head around how, it, how the different calls fit together. Um, should hopefully be useful too. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so uh, the others that are implementing, I believe, uh, team up is uh, slightly delayed uh, due to some resourcing issues on uh, in in that uh, little mini project that's going on, and uh, also uh, the um, uh, the make sweat work that Nick's doing, I believe, is on the way. Uh, we haven't seen anything yet, but he's joined the W3C uh, Slack and he's kind of uh, slacking back and forth. So I think that's happening. Um, I know the legend stuff is is cracking on. Um, I've got to get back to them today with some further feedback. Ian's on holiday, so he's not on this call today. Um, but um, and I know Raymond's not there either. So Guy, I'm afraid you're representing <laughs> today. Um, but, uh, but yes, so um, uh, I know that's working out well. Uh, and so hopefully we'll continue to see that um, co um, merging with the work we're doing in uh, the spec. Great. Okay. Great. Yeah. I mean, this is exactly what how we wanted to drive this out is having people implement it as we as we work on the spec, so that we can identify any of these kind of um, any issues that come up um, before we're spending a huge amount of time um, improving the documentation. So yeah, it's a good experience. Um, okay, um, if unless there's anything else anyone wants to raise about booking, then I'm going to move us on and talk about facilities. Um, shout if there is. Um, so um, I recently circulated a um, update to the opportunity data model that uh, included uh, a couple of new sections. Um, to discuss how we can start to include availability of uh, facilities in, uh, in data feeds and just describe those. Um, after a number of discussions on these calls, we ended up um, opting for a kind of a product based view where um, the feed would be uh, including um, data on uh, the availability of a specific uh, facility, a sports hall or a pitch um, or a table tent. Yeah, table tennis table, um, and you know what the what the costs and what the event, um, sorry, what the slots are for those. Um, for, we're using quite a bit of the existing data model, so really the kind of the the debate has been around um, uh, how we create these kind of new structures. Um, the model as it is um, is using, um, as I say, it's kind of drawing on a kind of product centric view of the world. So I'm going to see if I can just. Uh, switch over to my browser um, just so I can quickly show that for those of you who haven't had time uh, to look at it yet. Okay, um, hopefully you can see that. Yep, no. Okay, I'm going to shout if you can't see it. Yep, yep. Okay, um, so the, the, the sections that we're, we're kind of discussing at the moment is this new section um, 4.9 uh, called the mean to use and then in the more detailed uh, data model section there's uh, 5.10 which kind of describes the, um, the properties that are associated with that. Um, the, um, I ended up, so let's start again. So, um, with this product centric view of the world, then the feed will just be describing the availability of a specific uh, a, a facility or piece of equipment. And by equipment, I'm mainly referring to table tennis tables here, because that's the kind of um, uh, the, the requirement that's come up in, in a few times. Um, I, we've had some of the feedback on the proposal so far is around the use of the word amenity and whether that's too confusing. Um, the, I ended up opting for that as a term because it, it felt like it covered broadly both facilities and equipment. Um, in some view of the world, so for example, in the Sport England Active Places data set, they make a distinction between facilities as fixed features of a, um, uh, you know, of a leisure centre or, or the facility um, and the kind of more movable pieces, so equipment. 
So I was trying to reach for a word that would cover both. Um, but there's been a bit of feedback that amenity is a bit too confusing because amenity has a, also a use specifically around, for example, hotel bookings and referring to you know, things like I don't know, towels or other kind of like, like features of a, um, you know, of a hotel or other uh, similar facility. So the, the first thing I kind of wanted to just check in on was that kind of discussion really about um, naming. Um, and so both Nick and uh, Jamie had got feedback on this. Um, so I just wonder whether you wanted to raise some of the points that you've made on in the GitHub issue here on the call. Um, yeah, I think we, as I mentioned on the GitHub issue, I think we would um, prefer it to be facilities, only that's what we use internally. Uh, and I feel that's more appropriate, even for a table tennis table. Um, but you know, ultimately, it's probably just semantics. So I'm not um, overly concerned if we end up with a different word. Okay. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not wedded to either thing. So I'm just trying. I happily change the name if people think it's. Um, if it's more immediately obvious what facility use is as opposed to a kind of immunity, then I'm fine making that change. Um, but I think the way I, that I, I conceived of it is that it probably would cover equipment like table tennis tables. I think that would be fine. I mean, when you're making a booking um, for a table tennis table, and I use the GLL example in the GitHub issue, you know, they list a G uh, table tennis table in exactly the same format as they list. Uh, a football pitch or a tennis court. So, you know, even though it is a movable object, uh, I would say that facilities still can relate to a table tennis table. Um, and if you look at the general industry speak, you know, the FA uh, and the different national governing bodies will all use the word facility to describe a pitch or a court. Um, so uh, on that basis as well, I feel it's appropriate. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think I think there's a the, the semantic distinction between equipment might be interesting as well here because I think that potentially when we're talking about this this use thing, um, that is different to talking about the table tennis table as a piece of equipment um, because it sounds like because especially with the word use here, we're talking about that specific table being made available, which means wheeled out by the staff, put in the position, the bats are kind of brought out as well and all that stuff is then made available for a use um, for that particular time, and then it's taken back again. Um, so I guess it's, uh, it, whereas a bit of equipment is, is kind of more, because I guess it, it, what's the difference between the table tennis table and the badminton net? Um, badminton net requires a space to be put up in, uh, so does a table tennis table. Both of them are bits of equipment. Neither of them can be used without bats or without someone wheeling them out and setting them up um, and so I wonder whether it's just you know the same with a five-a-side goal you know you have to put the goal out but you then have a five-a-side pitch that you book which is the use of the facility and so in most cases although there are equipment involved in in each of these and in the table tennis example the bats are as well are equipment as well as the table so there's not just the table um, so potentially there's a thing about you know the equipment's useful to reference, and yeah, there's a you know the fact there's goals there, there's a badminton net there, there's a table tennis table and bats there, um, but actually this isn't talking about that. This is talking about um, yeah the, the thing that you're booking, which is a whole. Package. Yeah, I I would say as well in, in the kind of context of uh, booking sites uh, like ours, um, you know, if you're gonna cross sell or um, you know add on extras, um, for example, I I, I use the a uh, case of a bowling machine, which indoor cricket nets will hire out at an additional cost. So um, to that point, Nick, I, I, I might distinguish between something that, it's, that is a, you know, a fundamental property of playing a game of badminton or netball uh, or, 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 or table tennis. Um, and that, that can be included as an additional uh, purchase. Um, you know, as well as uh, the um, uh, bowling machine example, you could, you know, within football training, they often have bibs for hire or um, the different um, things that go into putting on a training session in football. Um, 
uh, vice, you know, and, and you could probably find examples in most sports of hireable equipment. Um, so I'm not sure I would put that in the same bracket as something that's, you know, pretty basic to having a um, game of uh, tennis, for example, played, um, a net, for example. Um, and I would might, you know, given this is predominantly around um, uh, being able to publish this data and, and, and make it accessible, I would might, I might think about a word that describes the equipment that you can hire as an, as an extra. Um, do we even need to consider what uh, a, a badminton net is in this context? Because it's not really be part of an API call, is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, that's useful feedback. I think I will revise the wording then and just focus it on facilities and just make sure it's clear in the in the definition about how we're, we're using that. Um, not not wanting to go on and to spend too much more time on this, but just uh, I know Guy, you're new to this call. But don't feel like because we're saying things with um, any sense of certainty or passion that you can't jump in and disagree with us completely. Um, do you have any view from the Gladstone perspective on what to call this or, or the you know, the, this facility idea, booking a football pitch or anything like that? Um, no, I was going to say, Jamie's made the same point that I was thinking of, that you do have these potentially floating um, bookable things, say ball machines for tennis coaching and things like that, where you might have, I might have got six tennis courts available, but only two ball machines available, um, which aren't, yes, you could book tennis quite happily um, six times, but you can only book it with a ball machine twice having that kind of floating thing just to to consider that scenario um yeah another thought this was just a look up of the word amenity and kind of synonyms the name resource is no one that could be thrown in there um which would they also it's a resource whether that's a physical room uh, an area a table tennis table a um a ball machine whatever it may be it is a resource that can be booked out and a given activity may require two resources or three resources or whatever it may be. One of those resources may be a compulsory thing. One of those may, some of those may be optional resources. So that would be another one perhaps to consider is just a, a more generic kind of resource, which would kind of cover various equipment and physical space perhaps. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that could work for sure. Uh, I've seen resource being used elsewhere as well. Resource for something specific in Gladstone, uh, guy. In terms of what um, we kind of, it's something we have. Say our architecture is a bit odd because we actually have products of the fundamental things you actually book out, which is all strange. But they're identified as resource products, um, so it is kind of a term we use within the Gladstone world as a bookable thing is essentially a a resource. Um, so yeah, it is, a, it is a term used within Gladstone world. Um, I wouldn't go down that route simply for that reason, but it did seem to be, I say, I just did a Google search on immunity and looked at synonyms and, and that's one that jumped out as something that would kind of make sense as something that might be quite widely understood and um, yeah, relevant to a variety of different things that would be considered a resource. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, that's great input. Thank you. Um, so the, the other thing, there were a couple of things that came up um, in, in the discussion on the on GitHub and um, on the mailing list, and uh, Raymond raised this specifically, um, is um, the impacts of uh, updates to the availability of facilities um, uh, in the uh, paging feeds in the, in the, in the and the data that people are publishing through that, that mechanism. So to, to give the example, you've got a sports hall that will have multiple configurations. Um, it can only be used in uh, one or a small number of those configurations at any one time. So as soon as a booking is made for a particular slot, that means that the schedules associated with those other configurations will all need to be um, updated or invalidated because um, you know, they're no, it's no longer available for a certain of time so in some cases that will mean that um, where uh, providers are publishing data about these uh, these facilities that have multiple configurations then there's going to be a lot of churn in their feeds every time a slot is booked out um, I'm not sure yet of the best way to address that 
um, uh, it would be useful to get a sense of uh, how uh, prevalent that issue is going to be, um, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, how, how many uh, providers are going to be using these kind of config, multiply configured facilities. I suspect it's reasonably high, but it'd be interesting to check. Um, uh, but also then, what are the ways to mitigate it? Um, the only thing I can think of is to actually move the some of the availability information out of the feed. Um, if we think that is the most rapidly changing piece of data, um, and that might cause problems in harvesting, then not including that, or, or either not including it, or directing people to another mechanism to check availability is the only way I can, I can think of at the moment. But I just wanted to throw it open to see what um, other people thought about that. I think, Lee, uh, Lee this is um, specifically around the uh, amount of data that's going to be sent through the, you know, the API. Um, not, not exactly. I mean, the, the, the kind of back end problem around that is the, the kind of software's problem, <laughs> not, the, not the kind of, um, it's not for this um, particular conversation. I'd be right in saying that, wouldn't I? Well, it, it, I don't think it necessarily impacts the data model, yeah. um, but it w might impact the amount of data that get, it's going to impact the amount of records essentially that will be updated yeah. in the feed, which means that um, everybody who's consuming that feed will need to be you know, continually pulling down new updates. Yeah. Um, so for some feeds where I, somebody's perhaps only just providing data on, you know, uh, pitches that are only booked out as a whole pitch, it probably won't, wouldn't be an issue at all. But any kind of leisure centre that has those, these these spaces that can be configured in different ways, yeah. then it would cause a lot of churn. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a very prevalent um, uh, case. And any 11-side AstroTurf football pitch will have five-a-side pitches across it that will be affected by bookings and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so at the moment... Sorry, go ahead. The, I mean, just the way we uh, tend to deal with this in terms of the quantity of data is just um, uh, tying the slots to a site ID or a facility ID um, so you don't have to pull in uh, duplicate data around the, uh, the, the the kind of venue as such, the facility. It's just um, pulling the specific slot information through. Right, so that mean, mean being able to check for a given slot, it, for a given pitch or hall, for example, mm. whether it's currently available. Yes. So I think what, what um, uh, Ray was saying was that uh, if a five-side pitch gets uh, booked, then the knock-on effect is the 11-side pitch needs to refresh its availability in order to account for that five-side booking. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way in a sports school, badminton courts and volleyball and basketball, etc. So um, it's just uh, whether you do that as a kind of heartbeat mechanism where it kind of sends through the updated availability or whether you refresh the entire set of, of availability on a kind of two minute basis or a five minute basis. Um, you're just recalling the slot data um, those slots are, are, are tied to a kind of site ID, um, but the, the information you're putting through is the kind of minimum required. Yeah, okay. There's so, a, in the, oh, oh. No, go ahead, Nick. I was going to say, there's another uh, couple of things that probably be worth referencing in here, um, uh, just to kind of add to that discussion. Um, there's the um, Google has an approach for their Google Reserve. Um, standard, uh, which is a, uh, there's two representations of an, an event in their standard. There's an event in the same way we would consider it to be, um, which is a full blown, all the information, 7.30 on a Tuesday yoga class. And then they have what they call a compact representation for a schedule, um, which is optimized just for the idea that you've got a pattern of recurrence. And then there's things that are excluded from that pattern as they get booked. Um, so a kind of inverted version of the same. And so that would be that's useful for kind of hairdressers appointments is what they've they've used. But obviously, that's the same as it is a football pitch. Um, and so it'd probably be worth throwing that in as a they've identified the two use cases and they've obviously got this um, notion of a um, 
kind of reverse view. And then the other thing is that um, Book When, when they did their implementation, um, had the same issue with their recurring schedules, which was their recurrence rules um, were kind of in one place. And then they had to um, give updates about the actual events that were generated inside those recurrence rules. Um, and what they did is they actually provided two feeds. One feed was of the um, recurrence rules, um, and the other feed was of the um, of the availability. And so there's only the availability updates. Um, and combining those two things together, the Google View and the and the kind of what Book Quen has done, um, you could feasibly see one feed containing the um, timetabling stuff. Um, and then the other feed is just when there's a booking made that those ping through as exclusions. And if the exclusions are there as a, as a feed against, as Jamie's saying, the slot, um, uh, as an, against, sorry, the site, and, the, and then you're only passing that information, um, that might be one way of solving it because then you've got one feed which is really busy um, and the other feed is just kind of the, the template stuff around it, uh, separating those out. Okay, so they don't, so just to make sure I'm understanding, so that what book when are doing, oh no, that's different to Google. So Google are just publishing exclusions, so, so slots that are no longer available. Is yeah. What you were saying? Right. Yeah, so they, they publish a schedule, which would say, uh, they, schedule, they, they publish a schedule with two, with two properties, um, frequency of slot and slot length. Um, so, you know, 60 minute, a slot every 60 minutes of length 50 minutes implies a 10 minute space. Um, that allows you to create slots. And then within that, that sets your, your framework up. And then on the separate feed, you've got the exclusions come in. So as things are booked within those slots, um, then the exclusions come in, which means you're only transferring, effectively you're only transferring data when someone does something because you're only talking about exclusions um, rather than transferring kind of all the potential slots every time has changed. Yeah, okay. Right, so th there still will be, yeah, so that, that availability, separate availability feed would still be quite high, quite high churn, I think, even if it's just exclusions, you know, for, because we're talking about configurations here, so there's quite a lot of configurations that could be validated for booking one slot. That's right, but I guess the, the idea here would be that let's say that there are 10 or 20 configurations invalidated um, I mean, if there were 10, 20 ways you could use a particular pitch, um, or I mean, it would only be invalidated if there were, say, there was one pitch which could be used in 20 ways. Because obviously, if there's five pitches, then some of those other things might still be valid. So, if one pitch could only be used, then yeah, then you would ping through 20 updates on that feed. Um, but but given that the feed is is, a, I mean, you could put thousands of requests through that feed, and it and it wouldn't it, it, it would scale to that. So um, I don't know if if you're only passing through just those changes, potentially that's not a scaling issue. I guess the issue becomes more when every time you update one slot, you've got a, the feed then has all the slots for that day or that site or that whatever um, in, in, the, in the update that need to be updated. And that creates kind of a churn of quite a sizable um, payload as opposed to just the, the slot changes, um, which I think is what... Uh, what Jamie was saying about just this, the changes. Yeah, um, okay. I mean, that, that sounds like an option, although I think my initial thought is um, that means that everyone's got to harvest two different feeds um, and might create some uh, difficulties if somebody has to catch up. Um, you know, if they didn't get the original schedule, um, if we're only giving them exclusions. You know, if I start harvesting today, I might not have the schedule for that for that facility. Yeah, there's a race condition. That's yeah. true. Um, now, so the the other option is in the, in the booking spec, we've defined a new endpoint, um, which allows somebody to get the latest information for a specific event. Um, so the the other option is that that's the that, that's what you would do. That you would just um, before you start displaying a you know a calendar of, of slots or something to somebody you would make that call. Um, I mean it, even if you were harvesting, I think you would probably want to do that anyway, just to make sure that you were showing the user the latest information. 
what, what do people think, especially those of you who've been kind of implementing that? Uh, well, there's a question for Jamie on use cases. I'm assuming at the moment it, well, oh, I don't know. Do you want it? Is there a use case for, um, I want to find us at Badminton Court at 7 p.m.? Like, you'll need to know the availability of all the courts in order to answer that question, or is that not so much the use case? Um, so, you're talking about a kind of search for an available slot, or? Yeah, I guess yeah. I'm trying to figure out is the use case here. Like, I found my, I found the venue. Now I know I want to go there. I'm going to look for what's available and then kind of just see the timetable. Or is there yeah. like, you know, yeah, my searching for any squash court at 7 p.m. just find me or a, or a football pitch just find me something free and then give me. I think when you're when you're viewing a specific venue, no, I, I, I'd say you just want to see the set of availability. I mean, other businesses might implement from user journeys, but. Um, we certainly just like displaying the set of availability that is at that venue. Right. So you, yeah, so you haven't got a cross venue search for availability yet. Um, we do in some respects, but I don't think that would be something that you would build into this. That's more again on the publisher's side to manage that search, wouldn't it? Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking if you put the put the availability in the feed, then it'd be really easy for someone to, or relatively easy for someone to create a search of a free space available at a particular time across a number of venues. Mm. Whereas if you take the availability out of the feed and you only have it in the kind of the booking step almost, then you have to go and navigate to the venue first and then look at the um, for the availability. So it almost restricts, I guess that's the thing, it restricts that use case slightly. Because if you wanted to have live availability search across venues, you would need to either pull the heck out of all of those <laughs> uh, availability endpoints, which I know some uh, systems do, or uh, yeah, well, effectively, well, I mean, at that point, you're just circumventing the, the feed idea. You're just implementing a different version of that, that's slightly less efficient. And mm. it's not really my area of speciality that how you would implement that search, but. Um... I would assume that that's quite specific to the publisher, uh, how they want to um, enact that. And, um, but I don't, I don't know so much about the technical side of how you would do that. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't, well, I feel like that's probably the distinction, Lee. Like, it sounds like there's, I mean, if we wanted to allow availability search, um, then that would be where, where the feed is useful. Um, and, and if we if we don't, then we, we don't allow that use case to happen, which it sounds like Jamie's current implementation doesn't have. I don't know if other people want. Uh, is, is Tom there? Tom, is, Tom might be there. Oh, yeah, sorry. I am here, yeah. Sorry. Hey. Tom, do you have a view on if it's useful to search availability across a number of different venues, or do you want to just find one venue and then look at availability after? It's definitely useful um, to yeah to compare the availability across multiple venues. Um, however, I wouldn't say it was critical um, at this point if it caused unnecessary complications. I hope, hope, hope that makes uh, sense. But yeah, uh, depending on the actual workload needed to make it happen, it would be a great thing. But if, if yeah, I could see it spewing up of a, quite a few problems potentially. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And then and I was, I'm just, I'm sorry to prompt people because I know that there are views that exist. Uh, Siv, Sam, um, from your perspectives, do you want to be able to search across venues uh, or uh, in or for availability or just look at one venue? Uh, yeah, we definitely want to uh, search across multiple venues for facilities. Uh, so I think our use case is very much, I want to book a squash court within a mile radius of where I am at 7.30. What options are there? Um, and then ideally you want all of the squash courts from all of the different leisure centers or squash clubs or whatever. 
with, with the up-to-date availability information. So you're only showing stuff at courts that are actually available rather than potentially. Yeah, and it, does, it doesn't necessarily have to be a call through the session details on the booking spec because I, I know that that's a very expensive call. Um, but on the, the, um, the modeling spec, you, you have the availability of available, limited, and none, right? So, it's up, so you'd only really want all of the limited, limited or available ones. You wouldn't need to know the exact number and go all the way to the provider and do a, an expensive database query or whatever. Uh, final prompt, uh, Brent, I know you've been sitting in the background there. Uh, Flexi, do you have a view on this? If he's there. Maybe he's not there. <laughs> he might reappear later. Okay. Okay. I just yeah, I think you know it might be something we see it increasingly kind of being requested. I know obviously the nature of the market is that you are getting um, you know single providers, single operators buying out or taking on contracts with multiple load centers in. A lot of that is the potential then for users to use across different leisure centers. I know we clean the the COVID practice kind of fitness first, looking at kind of cluster gyms and how their facilities across a number of gyms in the in one area can be used so you know then you only need to build one swimming pool in, in one of your gyms and then all your members kind of go to there if they want to swim and you don't necessarily need to put a swimming pool into every one of your of your clubs um so that kind of thing does then this kind of clustering of gyms and locations um does lend itself more to a cross facility across venue kind of searches of customers of the user just kind of going I want to do x I'm not that fussed about which particular club I go to and I guess as an operator um, that's part of my selling is potentially that you know you can go to any of the any of the clubs um, to do what it is that you want to do um, just like going back a stage in terms of managing the amount of data we're sending and what we're thinking of, of in terms of these um, kind of immediacy bookings whatever we we call them um, and it is that situation of the kind of the multi-use sports hall type thing where we have that one kind of facility as such, or however it's split up, potentially can have lots of different things booked onto it so that if you then make a booking for badminton, that stops it being available for five-a-side football, it stops it being available for table tennis, it stops it being available for um, basketball and how many other activities could potentially take place in there where we're kind of trying to provide an update for that are we kind of thinking that having made a booking for badminton um i'm then going to have to update data for every single one of those other activities that could potentially be booked in that same space and is there some way of almost separating that out to go the basic thing we need to update on is the fact that, that particular resource has been used and then all the different things that need that resource um, you can just look at that one update in some way, if that makes any sense. Just to look at it in a completely different way. So, the, so the, the, one of the discussions from the, the previous calls that we've had is about the level of abstraction that we're um, mm. working at and whether, um, so it seems like there's two, well, maybe there's a third, there's a middle ground actually, which might be what you're suggesting, but either we kind of, the logic of, of like, how many badminton courts there are and like how the sports hall can be divided and all that kind of stuff um, could be exposed a bit so that people on the consumer side can calculate things like oh so badminton courts being booked does that mean i can still play basketball Ugh, depends so does that so there's that bit um i guess which is the question of so if we i think what we did, thought before was well if we put the abstraction at like the maximum level so we actually don't know if the badminton court and the basketball court are even in the same place. All we're exposing is a separate badminton and basketball product, and if one's booked, one disappears. Um, then you don't need to worry about any of the kind of logistics downstream. But um, yeah, yeah, I can see the benefit if we. Obviously, it would be. It's almost like we're trading off like complexity of understanding all the bits. Yeah. The volume. Yeah. Yeah, and it's. Yeah, it's difficult because it's one of those. It is in some ways we're looking at the squash courts and things like that where it is you just book it 
it's one thing that you book on that that area it's it's not such an issue it is those multi-use kind of areas that present a much more complicated problem because of this kind of overlap of if you do that you now can't do that over there etc i think um yeah i think this is a quite complicated question um i think it is definitely something that is very worthwhile to solve i wonder if it's if it's the level of complexity where the best thing to do is to like um so it's to get the, the less controversial um version one where only the single use yeah i think that's a good way to go as you end up designing something for something very complicated um that then makes the simple stuff less performant or more difficult more difficult to understand more difficult to implement all the rest of it and might be going look let's do something that works for the simple scenarios and then if we need to do something a slightly different approach for the complicated multi-use scenarios then we deal with those almost as a put those as out of scope and going right there's the kind of first one we got where it's you're booking into a aerobics class that takes place at a set time on a set date that's nice and simple the next level up from that is the squash court kind of scenario where all you can book on the squash court is the squash court but you can pick your time of day um when your date and when it is you want to do that that's your next bit and then the third bit is then almost treated as as differently as you've gone from kind of aerobics classes to squash are two very different use cases and potentially a completely different solution and when you go to multi-use that's almost another step again and could be a completely different solution that has to be put in place for that you don't try and blend the two otherwise yeah you get this kind of sort of mongrel solution that kind of works for both but doesn't really work well for either one and you're always um the compromises you're making to get something that works for both um yeah better way is just to complete them as treat them as two completely separate things I think as well as that benefit we would get is that we would be able to get. Can't quite hear you, sorry. Could you speak to the microphone? Before, uh, uh, well, more quickly, with less controversy. Sorry, could you say that again just close to the microphone? Couldn't quite catch oh, that. Oh, yeah. Hello. Uh, so, yeah, well, yeah, as, 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 yeah as, as well as what you're saying um, about the Mongol solution, I think just the, the fact that this is a complicated issue means that uh, I suppose it will be quicker to get something out there if um, if we were to focus on single use just for first iteration. Yeah, I'd very much agree with that. I think, yeah, go put those multi-use things as kind of out of scope for now and in some ways almost don't consider them in the design for these initial amenity star bookings or facility bookings, whatever we call them. Um, and just kind of go there they're just a completely different use case altogether what might be quite interesting to do is is, to, is work this for the simple case and then in, what, in one of the implementations that's already uh, i know i know that um uh, tom is going to be making some headway with um, um guy with your api kind of extracting facilities from there um, <laughs> Making that open, whether it'd be worth kind of trying to implement it with a simple case, covering the complicated case, and just see how much of an issue it actually is, and then obviously we'll then have actual data to then go back and see if we need to engineer a more complicated solution, as you say, uh, and tackle that as a proper thing rather than yeah, yeah, that gives us a way. We're not, we're not, yeah, we're not wasting time for such developing something. That we can. It's one of those of develop something throw it at the problem see if it works and yeah if it doesn't then you kind of go well we were half expecting it we'll go away and think about it um and if it does work then okay great we didn't kind of spend time unnecessarily trying to solve a problem that in the end didn't actually need to be solved yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool i think that sounds like a good compromise to me um, yeah, I, I agree with that with that strategy fully i think that's the that's the best way to tackle it at this stage yeah. What well, it means we don't, um, because this issue doesn't specifically affect the way that we're planning to structure the data, at least for the, the simple case, it means we can just kind of, we can, we can encourage people to start making that data available um, and making sure that then it is bookable um, whilst getting some 
um, either putting some more thought into the more complicated case or just, as Nick was saying, getting some implementation experience with it. Um, so it would be perhaps just acknowledging um, I, we can keep something in the spec and keep an open issue up for the for that you know, for this multi-use case use case. Um, and just note that it's it's something that we're still working on. Um, just make that clear to everyone. Okay. Um, I I will as part of, the, of following up on this call. I think I'll. Uh, Circulate that to the list. Just see what um, other, if anyone else has other um, other thoughts on that. Whether there's any concerns about that as an approach, or whether other people are happy with, with kind of moving forward on that basis. Um, we we are nearly out of time. Um, about five more minutes. Um, is there anything else that we want? Anyone wants to say about the kind of facility stuff? No? Okay, um, if you um, have any other thoughts, then I, I say I'll circulate the slides. Uh, there's a link to the GitHub issue where you can, you can chime in and I'll put, some, uh, I'll put some summary of what this discussion is. Um, what, sorry, the discussion we've just had onto that issue as well, so just to kind of capture where we've got to. Um, the, yeah, this is good. It's, it's been kind of a, a productive discussion, I think. Um, the the other stuff I was going to talk about, we're not going to have time to cover the the kind of uh, data quality, data validation stuff again this time, but that's fine because we've we focused on uh, moving some or addressing some potential blockers with moving forward on the other the other bits of work. Um, I did want to just kind of last couple of minutes just briefly like draw your attention to the proposed updates to the paging spec. Um, that there were a couple of revisions that I proposed um, to just add some metadata into the spec, so into the feeds. Um, firstly, it was to, to identify um, which version, uh, so put a version number of the feed spec in there, or, or some kind of uh, indicator of which version of, of the feed uh, is being implemented. So that clients can start to use that as a cue for uh, processing data differently. If we have any kind of uh, future changes to data structure, etc., um, I'd suggested that maybe we might need to give some indication at feed level of the types of objects and the type of data that is included in the data in the, the so in the body of the feed. So whether it is about, whether it's a feed that's publishing data about events or uh, event series is something we've been talking about as a way to kind of group together events or the kind of amenity facility use um, uh, uh, use case. Um, and potentially, I think you know, Nick's just raised that there might be another variant type of feed, which is just about availability, some way of knowing what this feed actually is, um, think what it contain, I think might be useful. We do have the kind of broad kind of broad brush kind of kind key in there at the moment um, but it's not it's not very well defined um, so the the changes that Nick's already given some feedback on the the specific kind of proposals and I think there's some iteration I can do on that um, to make them a bit more general purpose um, but it'd be good to get some other other thoughts on that for from those of you that have or are currently implementing um, feeds to start to publish your data. Um, I have a feeling that we might want to include additional metadata in the feed at the feed level in the future, um, or at the very least being able to link together um, the feeds with other metadata documents. So at the moment, for example, everyone who's publishing data has a data set um, that, is, uh, that is, so there's data set metadata that's published as part of the um, of getting the kind of data set registered and on, on the, the dashboard, but that's not discoverable from um, the feed. So there's no kind of interlinking between those different um, different bits of metadata. So we might just want to put that in just to make it easier for people to find um, find all the metadata and all the related data that's been published from a specific publisher. Um, so we haven't really got 
much more time to go into the kind of detail of that today, but I think um, if, you, again, there's a link to the relevant issue on GitHub um, to talk about kind of revisions to that. Um, I, I think they're kind of relatively small changes. It's just kind of putting in a bit of future proofing, um, but it'd be good to get some feedback on it. Um, okay. So um, we've got to three o'clock. Um, is there anything else that anyone wanted to talk about today that we haven't had time to? Any specific I, questions? Uh, there's actually one question uh, I had about the, uh, the booking standard. Uh, but yeah, we, we'd gone past that by the time I uh, realized it. Um, so we, we've noticed that um, uh, we get uh, so there, there's a set of error types uh, documented in the booking standard, in the book spec, but um, we, when implementing with um, specific partners, uh, we will encounter a more varied range, uh, which will really often be quite um, custom to that specific integration. Um, so, uh, we were wondering if, if there, it was a good idea to have something like a, a special custom error type. Um, actually put a suggestion in the doc for something uh, but yeah I was just wondering what you thought about it. yeah I, I hadn't thought about it in any more detail than what you just said but it, it did occur to me that there may well be um, publisher specific error conditions um, just because of um, I don't know, like variations of kind of business models or other kind of preconditions that might might fail for whatever reason yeah. Um, so, um, having some way so that the error codes can be extensible, I think, would be a useful thing to do. And then, in a in the documentation for a particular implementation, capturing those yeah. in, in some form, I think, would be helpful. But if you want to, yeah, leave a document. Sorry, leave a comment on the document to that effect. That would be that would be great. That's all for me. Okay, thank you. Anybody else got any questions or things they want to highlight? No, I think I was just going to say it looks in good shape. So good work over there, guys. Um, I don't think it seems a million miles away um, from my perspective. So yeah, good good stuff. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad everyone is happy with it. It's kind of down to uh, uh, good work from from Nick and others um, to push this on. So, okay, in, in that case, I think I'm gonna wrap up. Um, uh, we're, we're spending quite a lot of these calls getting into details, but I think that's that's good. That's exactly what they're for. I think that when we first started out, we were having some quite high level dis discussions, but um, it, it's great that we're getting into a lot of the detail because that's that reflects the fact that we've made a lot of progress, I think. Um, so I kind of wanna continue, um, continue that and make sure that we've got time um, to cover these kind of issues in in the in the weekly catch up, the fortnightly catch ups, so I, I might just need to rein in how much I think we can cover in each of these uh, discussions for future ones. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for coming along um, and chipping in, and I'll do some follow up on the mailing list and also on GitHub to try and capture um, what we've discussed so far. So yep, yeah, uh, that's Thank it. Stephen, thanks for coming along. Cheers. See you later. Bye. Cheers, guys.